type in those questions. Um, we will address them as we go along here. And at the end, um, if there are any additional questions, we will address them. The general format is this is going to be 20 minutes to a half an hour of our speaker, Professor Chris Hutton, talking about the changes to the South Dakota Rules of Evidence, um, some of which, and maybe all of which, went into effect at January 1. So this is very topical. Um, I know that she and her committee and the Evidence Committee have worked very hard on this, so I appreciate her time in educating all of us. Um, at the end, there will be a chance for some additional questions. And finally, you can tell others um, this entire presentation is being digitally recorded and will be placed up on the State Bar's website. So um, that's the general format. With that, um, I'm going to turn the floor over to Professor Hutton. And the floor is yours, Professor. Thank you very much, Jason. And uh, hello to everybody out there. I'm glad you're uh, on this call today. Uh, at the outset, I would like to give you um, a couple of ways to get in touch with me. Some of you may not be able to be here for the whole presentation, and you may have questions. So first, I'll give you my phone number, 605-677-6300. That is my direct line. My email is C-H-U-T-T-O-N at U-S-D dot E-D-U. Um, the Evidence Committee of the State Bar undertook a project in 2011, and our um, goal was to take a look at the newly uh, revised Federal Rules of Evidence to see whether or not we should recommend to the court that the court amend uh, our rules to reflect the new language. The committee studied the language of the rules and uh, determined that the language was um, a decent improvement over the original language of the rules because our state rules are based on the federal. Uh, and We thought the new language was better. Um, we also realized that people would be using that language in federal courts and that people would be studying it that language in school, so we thought it made sense to see, you know, to recommend making the change. We also um, followed case law for about a year and a half to see whether or not the appellate courts were interpreting the new language as uh, merely stylistic changes, which is what they were couched as, or whether the courts were actually using these as um, substantive changes. And in all the cases that we came across, the courts acknowledged that the changes were stylistic only and not substantive changes, so that people didn't have to worry about somebody doing an end run um, by changing the language of the rules and then changing the meaning. OK, so we recommended to the state bar that the bar recommend to the court that these changes be made. In the meantime, the United States Supreme Court um, proposed some rule changes as well because there were a few substantive changes that they thought were important. Fine. So we presented all this to the South Dakota Supreme Court and they um, pretty much adopted the recommendation. Now, there were a few places in our state rules that did not track the federal rules and the uh, evidence committee did not want to tackle substantive changes. So we noted that there were differences and did not recommend changes. The next thing we knew, the Supreme Court, uh, our Supreme Court had noticed for hearing several rules that we had left unchanged. So as I go through um, the rules today, I'm going to point out to you not only um, what we have for the stylistic changes, but also U.S. Supreme Court changes and also South Dakota Supreme Court changes. And I'm sorry if it gets a little bit complicated, but I'll do the best I can. Uh, that's my giving you my phone number and email in case you have some questions at the end of all this. All right. So let's get going. Um, the, the court has moved the rules. They now are at SDCL 19-19. Uh, and so I think up on your screen you have the rules in Article 1, um, starting with Article 1, General Provisions. 
the committee recommended to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court adopted the language of the federal rules. There wasn't much discussion about Article I. Um, and so if you've got the language of the rules in front of you, you basically know that they track the federal rule language and um, you know that the language tracks the federal rule language and there, I don't have a whole lot to say about Article I. So we can move on to Article II. Okay, Article 2 is judicial notice. Um, there is a minor change, and the committee did recommend this. There, for those of you who practice criminal law, um, you might have noticed that the court had, that our, our former rule said that um, if the court took judicial notice, that the court um, would ha instruct the jury that they must accept uh, the facts that the court noticed. Um, that's not correct for a criminal case. And so that adjustment was made uh, to the section dealing with jury instructions. Again, no one has ever had a problem with that, but I just want to point it out to you. OK, um, so that's judicial notice and pretty much just tracks the federal rule now. You'll notice that Article 3 does not appear on your screen. Article 3 deals with presumptions and, um, and essentially presumptions and burden of proof. Uh, the presumptions are matters of state law. And so the federal rules really have almost nothing um, about the presumptions. And our committee did not deal with them, again, just because they're matters of state law. We wouldn't necessarily track the federal language anyway. So Article 3 basically remains unchanged from how it was uh, initially adopted. Article 4 deals with uh, relevance, and there are some changes here. Um, we adopted the basic language uh, of the federal rules for Rule 401, 402, and 403. When you come to Rule 404, there are a couple of uh, things that you might want to take note of. Rule 404 deals with character evidence. And um, when you are, uh, if you've got the rules there ahead of you, if you look at 404A2, uh, the defendant in a criminal case can put um, his or her character in issue. That's fine. Under sub capital B, the defendant can also offer evidence about the victim's character. Um, under the prior rule, if the defendant offered evidence about the victim's character in a criminal case, the prosecution could rebut with evidence to uh, with uh, rebuttal evidence about the victim's character. There is an amendment now, and this one came from the United States Supreme Court. Um, our committee did not recommend it uh, as part of the, uh, our presentation to the South Dakota Supreme Court. The South Dakota Supreme Court elected to place this up for hearing. I actually went and testified in opposition to this rule in September, um, but the court adopted it anyway. And it is 404A to capital B small sub 2. And this says that if the defendant in a criminal case does offer evidence about the victim's character trait, then uh, not only can the prosecution rebut with evidence um, about that victim's character trait, but they can now attack the defendant for the same trait. So that definitely expands uh, the use of character evidence in a criminal case. And uh, that is a new provision. I don't know how much utility there will be to it. I, I know there was not much federal case law on it, but um, I, I present it to you just because that's a brand new rule for us. Uh, also, in our uh, Article 4, again, dealing with relevance, um, let's see, let me, let me make sure before I go too far. Um, we adopted the rest of the language of the federal rules. Um, up to a certain point, but I want to point out a couple of differences. Uh, in our state 
legislature. Um, it, it was requested that the state legislature um, deal with statements by health care providers in the context of um, you know, treating an individual who maybe had been subject to some kind of an injury. Um, this was, uh, it, it appears at 411.1. Um, our committee did not recommend any changes that had been made to anything that the legislature presented uh, or enacted. Um, I know the court anticipated that that would still remain in the code. I think that provision at 411.1 still does remain in the code as far as I understand it, but I'll point it out to you just because that's uh, not in the federal code of evidence, but it is a legislative enactment in our state code. Uh, continuing on Article 4, um, the federal code has rules 413, 414, and 415. Those rules allow the use of um, evidence of similar crimes in sexual assault cases similar crimes in child molestation cases, and similar acts in civil cases involving sexual assaults or child molestation. So those rules are 413, 414, and 415. And as I said, basically that allows um, the defendant's prior conduct, prior specific acts to be brought in in uh, molestation or sexual assault cases. Our court considered uh, adopting those rules a few years ago and chose not to. The South Dakota legislature considered adopting those rules a few years ago and chose not to. Our committee did not contravene those decisions by recommending adoption, so even though those rules appear in the federal code, they do not appear in our state code. Um, the rationale, as far as I understand it, is that um, the South Dakota Supreme Court interprets Rule 404B on other acts evidence pretty broadly, and that probably uh, covers what you would be bringing in under 413, 414, and 415 anyway. So I think they felt that the rule was not necessary. Um, I'm hoping that if anybody has questions, you're, you're posing them. I, I'm not seeing any on my screen. And Jason, I don't know if you have any on yours, but if you, if you need to interrupt me, please do. And I certainly will, Professor. I've not received any yet. Um, you know, and to the extent people do have questions, please type them, and I, I will do it right away rather than waiting to the end. It makes more sense that way. Okay, uh, that sounds fine because I'm kind of talking to myself here, and I want to make sure people are following. Okay. Um, all right. Next thing uh, after Article Four of the rules, we have Article Five. Article Five deals with privilege. And um, Article 5 on privilege does not appear on your screen. It does not because privilege rules are a matter of state law. Um, our privilege rules were derived from the Uniform Rules of Evidence when our evidence code was originally enacted in the 70s. We did not study those and recommend any changes. The court did not make any changes to Article 5. And so the privilege rules that you have been working with um, you know, since the 70s are still in place. Um, other than they have been moved along with everything else, and they now appear as 19 19 uh, you know, 501 and so forth, whatever the, uh, the appropriate rule number is. So the uh, privilege rules, no change. Professor Hutton, that actually ties in with a question we just received. Um, the question is asking to explain the numbering of the new. Um, Chapter 1919, and will the numbers be changed in the code? I think, I mean, explain as I understand it, the numbers just reflect um, within ch Chapter 19, and then the three digit number ties out to the federal number. Is that right? That is my understanding as well. Uh, and um, so you, if you have the, the paper copy supplement that um, we all got for our codes, I guess, in the summer. Uh, that has the old language, even though everything was moved to 1919. Um, as of January 1st of 2016, an order came out from the South Dakota Supreme Court um, basically uh, adopting the new language. And so all that is codified 
at 1919, and yes, the particular provision tracks the federal provision. Um, but as I mentioned, we have, for example, 411.1, dealing with health care providers' statements. That does not appear in the federal code. It is in our state code, and it's just um, given its own separate number. I think that addresses the, the question. So go ahead and proceed. OK. Uh, next, we take up Article 6, and this deals with witnesses. Um, many of the provisions in Article 6 remain unchanged. And if you have your um, articles near you, you know, you see that we're just talking about witnesses taking oaths and having interpreters and that sort of stuff. Um, but we also have some rules that are pretty important in terms of impeachment of witnesses. Rule 607 provides that you know anybody can impeach anybody pretty much, and uh, that is still in place. Rule 608 still in place. Rule 609 is different. Um, South Dakota, along with um, many many other states did not adopt originally the language of the federal rules dealing with impeachment of witnesses with prior conviction. Uh, South Dakota's rule provided um, that the probative value uh, of the uh, prior conviction had to, uh, had to uh, exceed its prejudicial effect for the defendant and for witnesses. Uh, so there was discretion on whether to admit it. And also, uh, if you had a prior for dishonesty or false statement, there was discretion whether to admit that. That was 609 as it first existed. 609 has been changed. And again, um, I testified about this. And um, I, I, I have always preferred the South Dakota rule, but the court basically did not uh, agree with me. and. So now we have 609, um, the federal version of 609, adopted in our state code as well. And there are some important things that um, people should be aware of. When you are thinking about impeachment with a prior conviction, we now have uh, the provision that if you are talking about impeachment of a witness with a prior conviction, the prior conviction does come in unless using the standard of Rule 403, uh, the prejudicial effect outweighs the probative value substantially. If, though, the witness is the defendant in a criminal case, we're going to use the same standard we always did, which is probative value has to ex exceed prejudice. In addition, the court adopted the federal language for um, 609A2 dealing with impeachment with crimes involving dishonesty or false statement. As I mentioned, it used to be the case in this state that the trial court had some discretion whether or not to admit such a prior conviction. Uh, the amendment eliminates that discretion, and essentially the prior conviction will come in if it involved dishonesty or false statement, as long as it's within the 10-year time frame for uh, those prior convictions. So that is, um, that's a big change. I will point out to you that the, um, the federal rules were amended to try and reduce um, the use of some of prior convictions involving dishonesty or false statement. There is litigation um, concerning what counts under those convictions. I am in the midst of trying to prepare an article on that that I hope will be helpful in this respect. Um, but um, I guess I'll just uh, point out to you that if you are, um, if you if you thought there was some uh, possibility of keeping such a conviction out, I think that yeah, that has been reduced with the new language of this rule. <clears throat> I think I'll be quiet for a second in case there are questions about that. It's, um, it's new enough that people might want to think about that one a little bit. OK. Um, the next article that we need to talk about is 
Article 7, and this deals with opinions and expert testimony. We uh, now track the federal rules except in an important respect, and that deals with Rule 704. Okay, the rule that you have in front of you uh, appears at 19-19-704, and you see that there is only one section to the rule. Under the federal code, that rule has two sections. Um, our court considered and chose not to adopt sub B of the rule. I also testified on that even though they had noticed it for hearing and I objected to that and, and on this one I guess the court agreed with the position that I took and some other people take. Uh, and here's the deal on 704. 704 says that uh, testimony is not objectionable, opinion testimony is not objectionable uh, simply because it reaches the ultimate issue in a case. It does not mean that testimony is automatically admissible, it just means that it's not automatically excluded because it reaches the ultimate issue. Um, we were late in adopting that rule. Uh, it wasn't until the early 90s that the court did adopt it, so we've had it for about 20 years. 704B uh, was implemented as part of the uh, Insanity Defense Reform Act that Congress passed uh, after John Hinckley attempted to assassinate President Reagan. And 704, uh, uh, you know, he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, and many people were unhappy about that, and part of the response involved uh, implementing a new section to the rules of evidence restricting expert testimony on an individual's mental state. 704B has been controversial since its enactment. Um, our court considered adopting it and chose not to adopt it. So if you've got your federal code there, you see that uh, 704B is in the code and uh, we do not have it in the state. This is one of the, um, one of the areas of uh, difference and it's, I think, an important difference for people to be aware of. Also, uh, in um, Article 7, you can take a look on your screen at 706, uh, and this deals with uh, court appointment of expert witnesses. The um, Evidence Committee did not really look at this um, as an area of potential change, um, and I think our committee was fine with the way the, the rule was already uh, in place. But the South Dakota Supreme Court on its own noticed this for hearing and they adopted the federal version of 706A through E. So you'll see on your screen that those sections of the rule now track the federal uh, version and um, I don't think it was controversial but I, that was one that the court uh, went for on its own. Uh, the next rule I need to talk about, uh, Article 8 the hearsay rule. <clears throat> the committee recommended to the court that it adopt a, or, or rules 801 and 802, no problem. We also recommended adopting 803, but um, the United States Supreme Court has made some amendments to 803 and I want to point them out to you just because I think they're they're noteworthy. I don't know how much of a difference they're going to make to you, but I'll point them out to you anyway. Uh, the hearsay rules that we have in the state basically track uh, the federal rules. The new section that I want to mention to you, 8036E. So with 8036, we're speaking about business records, all right? And if you look at sub E, um, you'll see that this is a new section, the United States Supreme Court uh, adopted this one, and it, it just slightly changes the, um, the focus. It used to be that the rule basically said that if the court found um, that the circumstances showed a lack of trustworthiness, it would exclude the record, and now it says the opponent does not show. So now it has placed the burden on the opponent of the business record to show that it should not be admitted. 
under Rule 8037, we're going to do a similar thing, and it will be 8037C. Once again, uh, where you're talking about the absence of a business record, if you look at sub C, once again, we're going to say um, the opponent, the person who opposes um, use of this evidence, would have to show that there's a lack of trustworthiness. And again, that just shifts um, instead of just saying that the court has to find, it basically now puts the burden on the opponent. 8038B is going to do the same thing. 8038 deals with public records. And again, uh, under sub B, if the opponent um, it wants to challenge use of the record, they're going to have the burden to show that there is a lack of trustworthiness. Um, there is something brand new in the code, and this is at 804B6. And this is, um, this is a pretty big deal. I'll just wait till we get there. Uh, before we get to 6, I'll just point out that 5, um, 5 is our dead man statute. That is a matter of state law, and that continues to be in the code. But 804b6 is, is a pretty big deal. Um, if you are thinking about a hearsay exception or a confrontation clause objection uh, to evidence, under 804b6, an individual who might make such an objection is precluded from doing so, forfeits that objection, if that individual uh, caused um, the person who would be speaking in court not to be there. So for example, if you have the defendant in a criminal case who kills the person who would be coming in to testify against him or her, the hearsay statements can come in. Um, and confrontation clause objections will also disappear because the defendant is viewed as having uh, forfeited those objections. The United States Supreme Court decided a case addressing this issue a few years ago, Giles versus California. The court said there that the defendant has to have the intent to keep the witness from testifying. So it's not just that in every murder case um, you would end up applying this rule. But the idea basically is that if you have an individual who is endeavoring to interfere with the operation of the uh, justice system or in the court system, that we're not going to um, allow that person to invoke hearsay and confrontation clause rules in his or her favor. 804b6 has been adopted um, by at least half the states by now. I think the number is about up to 30. Um, this is a rule um, that is in place in the federal and you know, as I mentioned, many state systems, and I, um, people seem not to object to its enactment. Um, how it will be interpreted is, is going to be another question. But uh, our court noticed that for hearing and, and adopted that rule uh, effective now. Uh, I would also point out to you under our state code um, at 1916.38 and 1916.39, way back in the day, those of you who were dealing with the hearsay rules involving children's statements in criminal cases and civil cases, um, those rules are state rules, not federal. Those rules, uh, as I understand it, will appear at 19-19806.1 and 806.2. Those rules have been preserved and that's where you're going to find them. Um, I, I did not see them in the um, uh, rules enactment from the court, but I, I think they have already been incorporated. I only have a couple more to talk about. Um, and these deal with rule 902. So in Article 9, um, you've got the provisions dealing with um, foundations and such. Um, if you go to 902.11 and 902.12, we have uh, two new sections. And 902.11 is probably the one that you're going to pay the most attention to. Um, if you're talking about business records, under 8036, 
we uh, now by rule can have a certification of the custodian. I know many people would stipulate to uh, the admissibility of records and lay the foundation that way, um, but now there's a particular rule provision that says you don't need to have the custodian and we can have a certification instead and that's going to be sufficient to comply. Um, 11 deals with regular business records and then uh, sub 12 deals with foreign records. And uh, the evidence committee thought this was an okay provision. Nobody objected. The Supreme Court apparently thought this was a good idea as well. Um, I don't know of anybody who did object to it, but that's just to point out that that's a, a new way of uh, authenticating documents. Um, that's the run through on the rules, and that was pretty quick. So I don't know if there are questions that are coming in or comments that are coming in, but I'd sure be happy to try and deal with those if, um, if you need me to. Okay, Professor Hutton, thank you. Um, we do have a question. I'm going to scroll back up to the appropriate rule so that people can look at it, and then I will read the question to you. Um, and in the meantime, while I'm doing this, others, please, if you have questions, um, submit the questions so that we can address them. We want this to be as helpful for everybody as possible. Okay, back up at Rule 702, okay. the question says, 1919-702 sub 3 requires the expert to rely on the facts of the case. In a civil case, how can we use an expert for educational purposes only in a broad sense without knowing the particular facts of the case? Subsection 3 seems to prohibit an expert for purposes of educating the jury. Can this be overcome pursuant to any other rule changes? Oh, I don't think it is intended to preclude that at all. I think um, what the section is designed to do is to try and make sure we don't have junk science in a courtroom and instead we we pretty much fit what Daubert requires and uh, I don't think that's what that is supposed to do. So I, I would not uh, hesitate to try to educate the jury. Other question for Professor Hutton. Um, here's another one. Is there any legislative history on these rules? Where would that be found? Um, does the person mean the federal version or the state version? I'm assuming they mean the, the, the state version, but to the extent you have a quick answer on both, because I'm not sure, um, maybe you can provide that. On the state version, I think what you would want is um, what I have on my uh, in my file on my desk here, which is the evidence committee report to the South Dakota Bar, which then was forwarded with some additional comments by the Bar Commissioners to the court. Plus, I have a copy of uh, the chart that charts that I submitted to the court on the rules that I testified about in September. Um, that would be the state legislative history, which is not much and it's not legislative, but that's what they were given. In terms of the federal rules of evidence, um, there's the original um, advisory committee note uh, for each rule from when the rules were enacted in 1975. Then there have been amendments since then, and there's an advisory committee note for each amendment. And then for the 2011 amendments that were just stylistic changes, there is a note, advisory committee note for each rule that basically just says these are stylistic changes only, not substantive. Um, Another question. Thank you. And they, they confirmed they were looking for the state, so I don't know that we need to delve further into the federal unless you want to do so. Um, this question is, can you briefly recap the discussion on the rape shield statute? The rape shield statute is uh, rule 412. 412 um, tracks the federal rule. Our court adopted this a number of years ago. I forget in what year. Um, I know in 2011 they considered uh, when they when they were dealing with the um, oh gosh they we had a provision in the criminal code that was very brief and then they enacted the long version of 412 and I think that was in 2011. 
and they tracked the language of the federal rule at that time, there was not any additional discussion of the specifics of 412 uh, in our committee or in front of the court um, in this project as far as I know. So I think the, the most discussion on uh, 412 would have been back in uh, 2011. We had two people pose the exact same question, and they want to confirm when these rules went into effect, Professor Hutton. These are, Jan these are all in effect right now as of January 1, is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, uh, if you go to the UJS website, if you um, check on the rules, there's a, a provision from the court of pretty lengthy um, amendment from the court that says, every, or notice from the court that everything is effective as, I think it says January 1st of 2016. Yeah, I think that, I, lo I found it when I was reading at the start as well, so I, that's what I understood. The same sort. Okay. Any other questions from anyone? Give it a minute or two yet. Should I give my phone number and email again? Absolutely. Okay. Telephone number 605-677-6348. My email is chutt O N at usd.edu. Uh, I'm more than happy to tell you what I know or don't know if you call me or email me. And we've picked up a couple more here, so let's. I'm going to cycle back to another question on 702. I get our expert testimony in. Okay. Okay, the question is back to 702, there is a ruling in a civil case relying on subsection D prohibiting expert testimony when the expert had not specifically reviewed the facts of the case, such as the medical records. This language can be argued to follow the, the Daubert guidelines. Any advice how to argue that an expert can give an educational testimony in complicated cases, complicated medical cases, any statutes or rule you could provide for authority on that? Um, I think 703 is also of use in that context. Um, I see what you mean about 702, but I think it is supposed to be a rule that gives the expert a little bit more leeway, 705 as well, um, because 705 says you don't have to first testify. I understand that just gets rid of the hypothetical question, but I think uh, 703 is supposed to um, allow us to have experts give us some education if we find it, you know, helpful in the case. I suppose if you've got an expert who is basically just going to give background information, if you've got a judge that um, seems unwilling to allow that without reference to the facts of the case, the expert, I, you know, obviously could take a look at them and even if the review is fairly minimal, that, that might help. Okay, I'm going to cycle ahead to Rule 804. The question is related to 804.6, Professor. 804.B.6, all right. Yep. Do the efforts of a third party, not a party in the case, prevent the testimony of a witness? Could you comment on the, the, you know, the effect of, of a third party, not actually the party to the case, excluding um, the testimony of a witness and whether this would be a way to get that evidence in? Yeah, the language of the rule says um, if the party wrongfully caused or acquiesced in wrongfully causing the unavailability, um, then they uh, forfeit the uh, objection. I think if you're a person, if the individual did not actually cause, 
and a third party is the one that caused, then uh, the opponent would be arguing that the um, individual in the case uh, acquiesced in wrongfully causing. And that's just going to be a question of fact for the court in a, in a you know, hearing to determine whether or not there was any acquiescence in wrongfully causing the individual not to testify. Wonderful. Well, everybody, thank you very much. I, don't, I think that has completed all of our questions. Um, I'm going to be on for probably one more minute, so it's your last time of going once, going twice on the questions. Otherwise, I have no doubt that Professor Hutton would certainly be willing to entertain any questions you have if you contact her um, later on offline. And I want to, Professor Hutton, thank you again and your committee for the very valuable work that you've done and for giving your time today um, to help us all. The CLE committee um, thanks you. You are very welcome. That is, and I don't see that we have anything else. So with that, everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Um, I will note, and there's going to be a follow-up email that goes out, but please, if anyone has any questions, and this is my plug for future Law for Lunches. Again, we're digitally recording these, and they're going to go up on the website um, probably as soon as this afternoon. Um, the next Law for Lunch will be in March. The speaker is going to be potentially a couple of speakers addressing um, mediation strategies, preparation presented on behalf of the ADR committee of the state bar. So again, thank you all and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.